Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. And then paradigm, this is really a paradigm shift a new way of thinking, and we actually use the term meta-paradigm because it moves into all our different areas now of thinking. Now, the term paradigm was popularized by uh, Thomas Kuhn in yeah. his book on the nature of scientific revolutions. And the way he used the term, as I understand it, is that a paradigm is not even conscious, it's subconscious. It's so implicit that we, we don't even know we have a paradigm. Right. So that when you present to people, here is my new paradigm, I would think a lot of people are not going to be able to grasp it at all because they have subconscious views they're not aware of that are in contradiction to your paradigm. So it, it, in the, the words of Robert Heinlein, the great science fiction writer, it doesn't grok. Exactly that. There is enormous resistance. Yeah. And of course, Kun spoke about the different levels of scientific revolution in terms of change in terms of thinking. We wrote a paper extending this in terms of different levels of change. Mm -hmm. You know, this stuff is too false to even be false. Right. You know, on the one side, yeah. absolute denial that can't exist. And of Not course, even the, false. <laughs> the paradigm of too false to be false yeah. is. Yeah, it must mm -hmm. be true, yeah. but the not even <laughs> false component is, where does this fit in? Yeah. And then gradually there's this resistance uh -huh. that maybe there's a little bit of data there. In maybe order for I something to, to be false it. to a conventional scientist, it needs to make sense. Then you can say, it's false. I, it makes sense, I understand it, and it's false. But if it seems nonsensical, then it would be not even false. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. And this introduces another great philosopher of science uh, expert, and that is Karl Popper. Yes, the, the uh, uh, philosopher of the scientific method. Yeah, and you see, Popper introduced the idea that in order to be science, something has to be falsified. Right. And it's a problem mm -hmm. because certain things have difficulty being falsified. Like so Popper's own theory. <laughs> uh, true, exactly that, very good. Yeah. And in terms of evolution, mm -hmm. how do you falsify something going back into the past when we haven't got that whole aspect mm -hmm. of time all the way through? Yeah and certain cosmological theories, mm -hmm. and in ways, certain aspects of psi. When we're talking about these multiple potential dimensions and these aspects of relative non-locality, it's non-local for us in three dimensions of space in a moment in time, but it might not be non-local in the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimension, and there one might be able to look downwards into that box from outside mm -hmm. that box and some of the box might be mm -hmm. transparent and some of the box might be translucent we can see right in but when we look mm -hmm. at those things we have different ideas because how do we falsify that and we introduced an uns concept uh, that's dr edward close and myself called lfaf lower dimensional feasibility absent falsification. Mm -hmm. So we took Popper's falsification. Yeah, it's wonderful if you can falsify things in science, yes. but sometimes it's not feasible mm -hmm. to be able to fully falsify it. It's like in our little overt reality, we have a jigsaw puzzle. And we have different pieces of our jigsaw and we only can put some of them together, particularly when we're going to higher dimensions or when we're going to evolution or when we're going to cosmology and dark matter and, excuse me, dark energy. And when we have this, that jigsaw puzzle, we've got to say, it's not been falsified, okay? But it can be feasible mm -hmm. and it fits into the jigsaw.